Welcome to the Beamsville Church of Christ video ministry. Services are presented on YouTube, Facebook, and our website one week following recording. This week's message is titled, Waves of Grief. Thank you to Don, Paul, and Mike for being part of the video. The scripture reading is John 16, 17 to 22. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I am going to the Father? They kept asking, What does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you'll see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. Don quotes in the sermon from a Reddit post by user G Snow, and there's a link to the full text in the video description. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Beamsville Church of Christ worship service today. It's with great joy uh, that we worship together in person and online today. Happy anniversary, John and Connie. 68. That's a long time. Congratulations. You know how there should be uh, uh, medals given to people for things? Like there, that's, I, I also happen to think about this, if you have multiple children, you should have a medal. But uh, <clears throat> you get o o over the 65 anniversary, that's, that's, a, that's a medal of some sort, right, I think? Uh, as we start this morning, or today, I should say, uh, I would like to use Psalm 150 as our prayer as we start. Uh, I hope that it is both uh, a prayer request to God on our behalf. It's also hopefully a statement of intent uh, today as we worship God. Uh, so after I finish it, I'll, I'll end with amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the trimble and dancing. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, amen. Welcome everyone. Now, last Sunday, we talked about uh, Thanksgiving and appreciation, and all that was positive. And yet I know that in any group of people, even though there are lots of smiles, there are people who grieve. It may not be obvious, but grief, deep grief, is present in every audience. The reason I wanted to show that video today doesn't come across as looking like any kind of grief, but it, it was the genesis. It was the result of starvation in Africa where millions of people were dying of starvation. And so these artists gave of their time, sang this wonderful song that they created and all the money, millions and millions of dollars went to provide food for starving children in Africa. In any given day of a week, and even today, there can be a lot of smiles. But deep down inside, there will be grief on occasion. I came across an article this past week that uh, was simply called Deep Grief. And please don't be disappointed that I'm talking about grief, because it's a reality for all of us in our lives. These words written by a wonderful minister. The past couple of weeks have been some of the toughest of my life. My emotions have spanned the spectrum. Shock, sorrow, horror, intense anger, betrayal, 
disillusionment, disappointment, and utter bewilderment. I have prayed without benefit. I have read the scriptures from the Psalms and Proverbs to the words of Jesus and sections from Paul, James, and others without peace. When something terrible happens that you can't understand, grief wraps its tentacles around you, squeezing every bit of energy that you've been holding in reserve. In the most unexpected moments, tears well up within me. I, I can't seem to shake at this deep grief. I feel like the prophet Habakkuk, who wrote while he was in the pit and crying out, how long, O Lord? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? Or Job, who admitted, if I speak, my pain is not lessened. And if I hold back, what has left me? My spirit is broken. The great Charles Haddon Spurgeon wrote these words. Who can bear the weight of souls without sometimes sinking to the dust? To see this hopeful turn aside, the godly grow cold. The lesson of wisdom is, be not dismayed by soul trouble. Count it no strange thing, but a part of ordinary ministerial experience. Live by the day, and do not be surprised by those who fall. Let's admit it, all of us have fallen. We have sinned, and God is our gracious, loving, forgiving God. And do not be surprised when grief floods your soul. God is a loving Father who wraps his arms around us. God said that he is always with us. And I just like to picture God sitting beside each one of us, his arms wrapped around each one of us, reminding us and whispering to us that he loves each one of us deeply, reminding us that he knew you before you were born. He knew the exact time and place in which you would be born, and he has never abandoned you even for one moment, even when sometimes you feel like he has. Throughout the Bible, throughout the 66 books, there are reminders where God intervenes and comes into our life. He whispers to us and sometimes he speaks loudly. I am here. You are not alone. You are my child. I created you. I honor you. You will be with me again someday. I am with you every moment of the day. And when trouble comes, and trouble does come, and when grief comes, and grief does come, it's not that God has left us, but he sits with us in our grief and in our troubles. And we learn from grief and troubles. And it's never easy, but sometimes it's helpful if we go through the dark night of the soul, because surely someone else will go through it and you can sit with them and help them because you understand it. So all throughout scriptures, we have these comments that are made. An interesting book written by, we think, Jeremiah, the book of Lamentations, not what you'd call a happy book, but in Lamentations chapter 3, uh, starting in about verse 22, I think it is, uh, it, these are words that are, that are powerful words. Lamentations 3, beginning in verse 22. Because 
of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. His compassions are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I said to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It's good for a person to bear the yoke while young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord is laid on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him, and let him be filled with disgrace. For people are not cast off by the Lord forever. Though he will allow grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction. There are scriptures throughout the Bible that remind us of this, and Jesus talked about grief as well. In John chapter 16, starting in verse 17, John chapter 16, starting in verse 17, some of his disciples said to one another, what does Jesus mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father? They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. And Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, and so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? He's talking, of course, about his death, burial, and then his resurrection. In verse 20, I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. These are powerful words that Jesus speaks, reminding us that no matter what is happening in your life, you're never going to be abandoned and that grief is just a part of our life. And so in 1 Peter, again, there is talk about this. I find this really an amazing passage of scripture. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3 and going to the end of verse 12, Peter is saying, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's an exclamation point there. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance, listen now, that can never perish, never, spoil, never, or fade, never, because it's kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in this last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though even now for a while you may have to suffer all kinds of griefs and trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have seen him, sorry, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are, you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I want to stop there. How many of us have experienced the presence of God in your life? 
How many of you, when you've prayed or in a great worship service of praise and glory, that you can feel the presence of God? And are we reminded, even if we're having a bad day, that Jesus said, I am with you always. I will never leave you. We may, on occasion, leave him. He will not leave you. He will never abandon you. His arms are always around you. And so as Peter, as an older man, learning this lesson, he reminds all of us about this. Even though we don't see him physically, we love him, Peter says. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy for each one of us, for you are receiving the goal of your faith. You are receiving the salvation of your souls. If you're having a bad day, just remind yourself of this promise. It was spoken by his forefathers and spoken all throughout the ages. Jesus said to his disciples who were following him when Lazarus had died, Jesus said to his disciples, our friend Lazarus has died. But when you read the scripture, that's not exactly what Jesus said. What he said was, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep and I'm going to wake him up. Falling asleep meant that he had died. And Jesus comes and he raises him from death. Please don't think that has nothing to do with us. Lazarus eventually died and he went to be with God. And one day when the trumpet call comes, and when God says, the culmination of all things has now taken place, all those loved ones, people that you've known for years who've passed away so many years ago, you will see them again. We'll be part of it. We'll be part of God's glorious family, as basically that song said. Yes, there's deep grief. Yes, there's loss. But we have the promise of we will be together again. It's the promise of Jesus, not just the salvation of our souls, but the ongoing life that God will give to us. In 1 Thessalonians, in uh, chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, is a beautiful passage of scripture, starting in verse 13. <clears throat> Here's what he says. Jesus is talking about death, but not just about death, about life. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who have died or to grieve like the rest of people who don't have hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. When Jesus comes, all of our loved ones come with him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet him in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So these are beautiful passages of scripture reminding us about this glory that we'll be part of. But it doesn't, it doesn't stop waves of grief that wash over us from time to time. I searched high and low for the name of the author who wrote this. I couldn't find it. 
Maybe it was meant to be. So I read to you from this person who wrote it. It's called The Waves of Grief. If you've ever been on a boat where the waves were powerful and you were fearful, it kind of gives you that feeling, although waves of grief can sometimes be even stronger than that. Here's what the author said. When grief comes, as for grief, you'll find it comes. Sometimes it comes in waves. When the ship, and he's talking about a person you love, when the ship is first wrecked, you're drowning with wreckage all around you. Everything floating around you reminds you of the beauty and the magnificence of that ship person that was and is no more. And all you can do is hang on and float. You find some piece of wreckage and you hang on for a while. Maybe it's some physical thing. Maybe it's a happy memory or a photograph. Maybe it's a person who's also floating just like you. For a while, all you can do is float. All you can do is stay alive. In the beginning, the waves are 100 feet tall and crash over you without mercy. They come 10 seconds apart and don't even give you time to catch your breath. All you can do is hang on and float. After a while, maybe weeks, maybe months, you'll find the waves are still a hundred feet tall, but they come farther apart now. And when they come, they still crash all over you and they wipe you out. But in between, you can breathe, you can function. You never know what's going to tr trigger the grief. Might be a song, might be a picture might be a street intersection, might be the smell of a cup of coffee. It can be just about anything. And the wave comes crashing. But in between the waves, there is life. Somewhere down the line, and it's different for everybody, you'll find the waves are only not 100 feet tall, but 80 feet, or maybe 50 feet. And after a while, they still come, but they come farther apart. You can see them coming. It happens on an anniversary, a birthday, Christmas. You can see it coming, for the most part, and prepare yourself. And when it washes over you, you know that somehow you will again come out on the other side of that wave. Soaking wet, sputtering, still hanging on to some tiny piece of wreckage, but you'll come out and you'll learn to survive them. The waves will leave scars, but the scars are reminders of the power of the love. Always remember the scars of Jesus. Those scars are for our benefit. Grief is part of life. It's not something that we want, but it's something that we're part of. And so in these last many months, dealing with the pandemic, we've created kind of a new lifestyle. For the most part, things are going well, and yet other people have been devastated by their illnesses that have come. I offer this message to you today, 
not as a happy message, but an understanding that this is part of who we are, the part of Christ's love for us is so great that when those waves that wash over us come, he reminds us of the promise that he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You are my child, and we will be together again. And you will be with your loved ones again. So may we be an encouragement to others when the waves of grief come their way. Thank you. This has been brewing in my mind for about two weeks. Last week, I wanted to tell Don to sit down. I've got this. I made the mistake of watching a documentary on a Saturday night at like two o'clock in the morning. And by the end of the documentary, I was like wrestling theologically, praying, thinking of scriptures, struggling. I'm like, I gotta get to sleep. I've got, I gotta go to church in the morning. And uh, the documentary was about the homeless in Arizona, those that lived within, that had been ex lived in, uh, within not even a mile of all the the big casinos and the, the wealth and the fun. People that come there and gambled their lives away, hoping to hit the jackpot. Those that came to establish and buy homes, and then there was a boom, and then there was a bust, and there was like over 14,000 homes that were just abandoned because nobody wanted to buy them anymore. So there were squatters that would came and then there was a task, there was a long, and there were people that were so destitute that they were living in the actual drainage systems below, that was built below the city, so for flash floods. And uh, they had nowhere to go. And then it focused on the few people that had taken the task that, to meet these people where they're at, and through uh, giving and bringing food and helping them through their mental health and everything else and their, their despair, trying to get them back on their feet, get them back into society. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at them, I'm screaming like, where is the church? Where is the church in all of this? There was no mention of God, the two, two or three People that were doing, the Muslim men, because it was very dangerous, lots of drugs and stuff like that going on, and crime just in order to survive. And then I'm, I'm thinking, these, these, here are these men, there's no mention of God. There's no mention of, and then, you know, the, the person that was doing the documentary was being let down into this, uh, in the system there, and, shone the light and said, and there were three stark words that says, God still lives here. And it was a very dark and foreboding place. And, and I'm sitting there after a documentary and I can't, I can't, I'm wrestling. I'm thinking about the, the church and then I'm thinking about my role in it. And I'm thinking about passages about the one the passage, the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25, and my role in that and my lack of effort in that area, well, I'm very hard on myself. And I'm thinking about James 1 22, whoever knows the good that they should do and doesn't do it, sins. You know, don't, there's a point in this, don't worry, that's a good communion. And then I started thinking about you know, one thing after another, I thought about my time in Honduras, and then I started to feel good because, I mean, I did do some of those things, but I had to be away from here to do it. I, like, we had to stop work one day at 10 o'clock in the morning because we had to go dig a grave for somebody who didn't know. We had to, or we had to go another day help people in distress that were 
flooded, like, uh, it was just flooded. I was just, and those things happened. And then uh, one morning I walked, when I was uh, off of my surgery, I was starting to be able to walk. I walked uptown in St. Catharines. I, I was there at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. And there were all the homeless there walking the streets, getting up, coming up from the uh, Trauma Creek. I walked down there to, there's all kinds of homeless there and they set up their camps and they live outside and they, and they come up in, into the town looking for handouts and are going to the one church there, it's Westfield Church. It's on the corner of Oakdale and uh, Queenston. I've been there to help serve breakfast. I mean, but the thing was, I'm still screaming at myself. I'm still, and then I realized that God was there. And that even though people that wouldn't profess belief in God in this world, they're doing the works of God. They're doing God's will. And they're, they're communing with the, the homeless. And they're communing with the, the forgotten. And then I looked at Jesus' ministry, and what was his ministry? A stark difference between him and the Pharisees. Who did Jesus commune with? The prostitutes, the lonely, the tax collectors. He touched the leper. I mean, the Samaritan woman at the wall. And he talked about the stories about the Samaritan who stopped and helped the person that was robbed and beaten up and left for dead on the road. While meanwhile, while two people were on their way to church, the Levite and the priest passed by on the other side. The whole point is, is communion is a lot more than just remembering Jesus and what he did at the cross. It is that. But communion is a lot more as what we do in our everyday lives, living our sacrificial lives, because Jesus sacrificed his life for us. And doing the things that people need to be doing that don't want to do or, or don't want to do, or they just turn off the TV, don't have to watch it, or they don't want to hear about it. And uh, that's how the church grows. You read in the early New Testament that Christians were known for their acts of goodwill, even to their enemies and to those who persecuted them. And the church blossomed and grew because God blessed it. Because you know why? Because those people were communion with the people that Jesus would commune with and did when he was on this earth. And that's what communion is all about. Yes, it's about thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross and dying for me and dying for you. But he died for the whole world. He died for those living in the caves. He, those that are living in the sewers, those that are living down by 12 Mile Creek, those that, you know, we don't really, we know they're there. And I know, I know I'm preaching to the same because this church is full of good works. But this is what communion is all about, is going out and living the sacrifice that Jesus sacrificed for us. And it's been on my mind, and it's been bugging me, and... And I, I, I know I do things, but am I doing enough? And, and that's it's more for, for me than for anybody else. But these are things that I struggle with. But every, every Sunday I come to church and I thank God for dying for me. But am I living for him? And that's the question I ask myself. And if I am, can I do more? And can I make a difference? Can the church grow? Yes, it can, and it will, with or without me, in spite or in spite of me. But we thank God for the blessings that he went to the cross for us, for the whole world, for you, for me, for our families. And we thank God for taking away our sins away. And we need to... We need to share that. And we don't have to preach it in their face. We just have to spend time with them and make them feel like they're important, just as they are to God, they are to us. And let's go to God in prayer this time. Thank you, God, for 
the act of your sacrifice of your son on the cross for us. Help us to learn the power of communion as we share in the, the bread, which represents your son's body, and the fruit of the vine, which represents your son's blood. But help us to share our lives and share the goodwill of Jesus through our goodwill and acts that we, as we live out our lives on a daily basis for you. Praise all in Christ's name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Don. Um, for more information about the We Are the World song, uh, it was referring to the famine in the 80s in Ethiopia, Sudan, and Tanzania, if you'd like to look up more about that. Uh, as we close today, um, I think this fits with Don's message. Um, we're going to pray together Psalm 25. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are, my God, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from the from of old do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways according to your love remember me for you lord are good good and upright is the lord therefore he instructs sinners in his ways he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way all the ways of the lord are loving and and faithful towards those who keep the demands of his covenant for the sake of your name lord forgive my inequity though it is great who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways that they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who hear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are forever on the Lord, for he will release my feet from the snare. Turn, me, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. Look on my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how numerous are my enemies and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May iniquity and up, may integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope, Lord, is in you. Amen. Thanks for watching or listening. The Beamsville Church of Christ meets at 4900 John Street, Beamsville, Ontario. We are currently holding in-person services following provincial COVID-19 regulations. If you would like to be part of the videos but aren't comfortable joining us in person, you can send us a video. Get in touch via email or on Facebook for more details. Scripture quotations marked NIV, taken from the Holy Bible, New International Version, NIV. Copyright 2011 by Biblica Inc used by permission, all rights reserved worldwide. You can find out more about the congregation on our Facebook page or at beamsvillechurchofchrist.ca.